Hey YouTube, it's Robert Hall, and today I'm gonna to be doing something a little bit different. If you guys don't know, back at Photokina in 2018, I went over to Germany and I got the first look at the Panasonic Lumix S1 and S1R, and at the time, they were just locked down behind glass, um, and it was the first time that it was announced. So there was no hands-on or anything like that, but I've been interested in the Panasonic equipment for quite some time because I kind of think that they have the technology focus, the only technological focus that I think really is competing uh, on a big scale, especially with uh, companies like Sony and their full-frame dominance. So today I got the opportunity to come over and talk to Jim Schmelzer and he is the only person I know, and probably one of the few in the country who's actually been hands-on with the S1. So we're gonna talk about his experience today. Now, Jim is an ambassador for Panasonic Lumix, and the reason that I really respect his opinion is because every time you see him at a trade show, he is camera in hand, teaching people about lighting and photography. He is the most boots on ground ambassador that I know of. So I really value his opinion and feedback on the system, and I really wanna know more about his experience so far. So let's cut right to the purpose of this video. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and talk about how you managed to get hands-on with the Panasonic S1. Okay, so Panasonic endorsed a few photographers out there to get the ball rolling because they're gonna come out with this camera. And so I asked my boss at Panasonic, could I test it out? He said, no, <laughs> Japan, don't, they don't know you. Oh, they haven't wow. endorsed you. So we sent some images out there of my work and they remembered me and, and they said, well, we have an opening right now because of some other issues. We do have one camera you could test out, but just for a few days. So then I thought that if I got that camera in my hand, I would like to prepare myself because my job is to help other photographers with it. But what I think I would like to do is really put it through a bunch of different scenarios to see how easy it is to use. So in the period that you had it, what did you get to shoot with it? Oh my God, I think I ran a, a week of a marathon trying to do everything that I could without really stopping to play with the camera. I wanted to just test it right out in the field. So the first day I shot a fashion shoot. So we had a young model come in and I just wanted to do a really nice close up. Let's see the resolution of this thing for a nice close up. Then the next day I shot a wedding. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I just took this thing, put my flash bracket on it and, and ran out there and just started shooting. And I took the 24 to 105 with me to see if this lens could just, you know, do everything this whole wedding with this, with no time to think, you're on the rush, you're running with the bride and groom. There's, you know, no time to stop and even take a light meter reading. You know how it is on yeah. the day of the wedding. Yep. <laughs> I don't even bring the light meter on a wedding right? anymore. So. Real quick, before we talk about what else you shot with it, so how does it feel going from the existing Panasonic bodies that you're used to using to going to this new full frame? That's line? a really good question because for me, I didn't really have time to sit in there and study all the menus and was, you know, it, I just jumped into it and it just felt natural. I mean, it's a Panasonic Lumix camera. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, what else did you get to shoot with it? Then I shot some fashion stuff here in the studio. I also, we brought a girl in and we had her dress up in a Lumix uh, outfit made out of paper. Okay. <laughs> that was fun. It's just playing around, going, what can we do to make a little buzz with the Lumix brand? And then I took a athlete outside, jumping up to see, you know, how, if, how the image stabilization is and how it's capturing things. And then I did a couple more brides and a groom to kind of see the sharpness. I brought a really high-end wedding dress to a hotel downtown Detroit. I just wanted to see the detail in this dress. So yeah. I was beating it up pretty good. And that camera is just unbelievable. Well, I wonder what that means for the S1R then too, because of course there's gonna be the S1, which is a 24 megapixel body, yep. and then an S1R, which is a 40 something megapixel body. So I mean that, if you're really impressed by the detail of the 24 megapixel, then that means really good things for the 42 to come. Absolutely. So you said you had somebody jumping, you're, you're taking an athlete and you're, were you doing photo or video of them jumping? Doing photography. Okay. Doing pho so, and how do you feel like it performed in terms of tracking and? I think what I was trying to find out how quick it's focusing. Okay. And like you said, is that tracking mode 
the majority of times that I'm using the camera, I have it on face detection. Okay. So it's it's always zooming in on the eyes, keeping the eyes in focus. Mm -hmm. And where I always had flaws with previous brands of cameras is if something was out in front, it would focus on that. Right. And now to have it go past that, get to the eyes, for me it's just I'm just boom, boom, boom. You know how it is. Yeah. You're you know, trying to get as much different variety as you can, and you're hoping you've got a camera fast enough and you know good enough to do all that for you. Yeah, there's a lot of, it's kind of funny because I think eye and face detection, it's a cool feature of cameras in 2018 and now 2019. Uh, and you still see people online like, oh, I don't need that. But as soon as you try it, I, I cannot imagine not having any type of face detection um, on my camera now because I rely on it so much. I, I agree. I, I talk to my friends in weddings now. You know, my, my method, if you're raising up quick to a moment, like, you're, you know, you're capturing yeah. the tail yeah. end of it, first thing I can do is I'm automatically on a face. There's no fumbling around <laughs> yep. and getting across the yep. screen or anything like that. You're just there, and that is so helpful. Another question I get a lot is what if there's multiple people in the scene? Mm -hmm. And what you'll see is multiple boxes boxes yeah so that's you know in case somebody's questioning that out there yeah, it's pretty yeah. Cool. now do you still get some form of selection or is it just kind of you determining can, you can still tap the screen okay so you can be like i want this yep. one right so here. what's different about the panasonic brand is we do have touch screen and mm -hmm. you can zoom in on the images and slide through them and, yeah and then of course the image stabilization in the body and in the lens right so that's dual ibis is yeah ibis ibis is another feature that i think is I'm really not interested in cameras that don't have it anymore <laughs> right. because it's just so helpful. And as soon as you turn it, as soon as you don't have it, you're like, oh, how do I not get away? How do I get away with not using this? Well, we anymore? found that people that are in Seattle drink a lot of coffee, so they need dual, you know? <laughs> yeah, they need both of them. They need they have to have the lens stabilization and the in body. So when you were tracking that person, you also felt like the IBIS was really helpful in that scenario. Yeah, I, I mean. I do use a tripod in a situation where I know I gotta switch heads. Okay. Because then when you're on a tripod and you're switching heads, you just hold the shift key, lasso it, and shift it over to the next image and it pops right in. Okay. If you're not on a tripod and you're doing group shots where this person's good on one or two, <laughs> I love the freedom of going handheld. Yeah. As a shooter myself, I'm constantly worried about my background and my composition, mm. right? I got enough to handle thinking about rule of thirds, leading lines, their heads into this tree, it's too dark, oh, I gotta move the head in the sky, you know, I'm like. It's a uh, lot. It's a lot. And then for me to sit there and think about focusing, mm -hmm. I mean, I really, I know when to snap the picture, but you, you, when the model's moving or whoever, I'm constantly gotta adjust to keep it in the rule of thirds or that road behind or whatever it might be in sure. the right spot, so. Yeah. You know, some photographers just go out there and they're brr, brr. I don't do that. I kind of go like this first, frame up where I'm going to take this shot from, mm -hmm. stand my ground, and then kind of vary it a little bit. But right. to be able to handheld is. Got more of the sniper approach as opposed to the assault rifle. That's, a, that's how I say it. <laughs> I like that, yeah. I'm a sniper. I, don't, I, don't, I also don't want to do all the extra coing of brr, spray and pray. I agree. You know, so. So let's talk about the wedding a little bit. You okay. said that you use the 24 to 105. Is that, okay. that so primarily here's, what you use? See, when, on the day of a wedding, I have a video crew with me. Okay. Because we do photography and video. Mm -hmm. So I can't use strobe and everything. Okay. I have to use constant lights so that the video is the exact same lighting as my photography. Gotcha. So a lot of that, until the LED technology gets super, super bright, you're still dealing with some slower shutter speeds. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I need a camera that really has good IBIS and is r good in low light, mm -hmm. but you gotta figure, I'm never at a scene where I'm not lighting it. Right. I was raised to light everything, so I'm really not flying up into those really, really high ISOs, mm -hmm. but I want a camera that has great dynamic range and could perform everything that I need to keep my brand as who I am as a photographer. I don't want to compromise. So right. when we're filming and we're shooting throughout the day, a lot of the images on the video that the guys are filming with the G5, the G5S, the G9, the whole video crew, they're getting the same stuff I'm getting yeah. with my S1. And I don't have a lot of time to change lenses because mm -hmm. People are late, things are running behind, you're running and trying to take as much as you can. Sure. So my all-time lens is the 24 to 105. 
And of course, Lumix has that available right now and the 50 millimeter, and then we're going to have some other ones coming out there. But yeah, I used the 24 to 105 for the majority of the wedding. I believe they said uh, like 10 lenses by 2020 or something like that. So they, they've got a lot in the pipeline here. But yeah, launching with that 24 to 105 is great because that's a really nice, you know, general approach lens. Workhorse. You can use it for anything. Yes, <laughs> the so workhorse, workhorse lens. The industry. <laughs> for sure. And another good thing, and where some other brands have failed recently, and this is extremely important to a lot of wedding photographers, is it does have dual card slots. Yes, that's correct. And it's uh, it's a two different systems. I believe it's an XQD card and an SD card. That's correct. But you can write to both at the same time so that you have the redundancy on the file. Well, I think what's happening is we're preparing ourselves for the future because mm -hmm. when you start getting into those 6K and 4K and you know, and you want to shoot 60 frames a second, mm -hmm. you're going to need a card, a camera and a card that's already ready for the future. Sure. So I believe that that's why they went there to keep up with the data rates. Yeah, the data rates of the XQD card. Yeah, because I believe SD is kind of meeting the wall, right? <laughs> so now that we're actually getting into a camera with 4K 60, uh, yeah, we definitely need higher rates of transfer just so that we can yep. actually write it, which yep. 4K 60, this is, it's been done before, but this yep. is the first full frame camera, yep. full frame mirrorless camera that we've seen do it. So my whole future of really what I, what I would like to do as a wedding photographer is just to be able to videotape the wedding. I just want to videotape it cinematic style, even if it's walking up behind the bride up the aisle. But let's say I'm walking up the aisle and I'm videotaping her going up. I'm blocking all the other photographers, mm -hmm. right? But what if I could pull frames out of that 4K? See, 60 frames a second is showing us that I can use higher shutter speeds now, and I'm not going to get blur or anything. If I could just start extracting frames out of there, when I pull a frame out in Adobe and I turn it into a TIFF, and that's a large enough file to work with. Yeah, yeah, we've talked for a while about the possibility of using 4K as photo, you know, that's basically your, your acquisition, but then you're turning it into photo and it just doesn't work at 30 frames a second no, because you're blurred. Yeah. You're, everything's, you're, blur. everything's motion blur at 60 frames a second. But now with second. 60 frames, I mean, if you really said, what's the greatest thing to come out right now, it's gotta be 60 frames mm -hmm. second yeah. at, you know, big, huge files and I can pull any image out of there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so enough. that's what I was also testing. Yeah. I was pulling frames off the video at the 60 frames a second in 4K to see what those images look like. Awesome. And they're just beautiful. Now that's a whole new level of culling though. Do I still have to take pictures? Can I just videotape? <laughs> Are we there now? Can I just do this? I mean, we might be there. <laughs> you know, if you're good with the 4K resolution, then boom, we're there. I think the issue going to be then is looking through right. 60 you're cold. frames a second. You're cold. We're we'll giving them too much to choose from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, I think it might, that actually might work better for something along the lines of like a headshot shoot where you're not yeah. changing vignettes so much every day. <laughs> yeah. But you know, headshots rely on like such precise timing as Correct. people kind of go through emotions yeah. and warm and respond yeah. to whatever you're saying. Yeah. That could actually be a really good use. And I've, I've seen people try to explore that, but 4K60 is definitely the step that people need, you know, in order to get really crisp results out of it. Beautiful. So in shooting a wedding with it, how do you feel like the build quality stands up? Because I know one of the best things about the smaller cameras is that they have a really good build quality. You know, they're mirrorless micro four thirds sensors, even though they're really tiny sensors, their body is still really well built around it. So how did you feel about their full frame body? Well, remember we have the GH5, mm -hmm. then we came out with the GH5S, then we came out with the G9. The G9 really had that beautiful grip on there that was intended for photographers. Mm -hmm. You know, the G5, they might want to put it on a slider and some other things, maybe they didn't want all that grip stuff on there. Mm -hmm. Now with the S1, it's feeling just like that G9. It's got a good grip, good solid hold on it, you know. And but then if you see me in some of these video clips now, when I'm walking down the street, you'll see I have a black rabbit strap on me. The camera's just hanging, it's, and I'm just rocking it, fixing the dress or whatever I got to do. So I still feel like it's it's just rock solid in your hand. It's got a good feel to it. Yeah, and it's nice to see more companies implementing the ergonomics that are necessary to be comfortable shooting long days with it. Uh, because for a while mirrorless it was all about small 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 mm -hmm. but then it was like okay my hand is cramping trying right. to hold this thing right. so it's really nice to see companies focus on that again with bigger grips so you obviously got to shoot a lot of different photo opportunities with it but did you play with the video at all 
Okay, so on the day of the wedding, I was also, remember it's a hybrid camera, so I was also backing up some shots that maybe my video crew wasn't around. And then I also wanted to test it on, you know, how is it IBIS on handheld videotaping? So I got some images of like detail shots, just rolling with it. From everything I can see, it, it works really good. But then I wanted to check, how's the real dynamic range on this camera when I'm videotaping? Because mm -hmm. 4K is 4K. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on what camera you use, it's 4K, okay? Yeah, it's a resolution. It doesn't mean anything about I quality. could do that with the G5, the G5S, the G9, or now the S1. 4K is 4K. Right. But what's the dynamic range on this new camera? So I thought, why don't I test it with some really contrasty lighting? <laughs> because we all know where the problems are is in the shadows. Mm -hmm. What's the noise in the shadows and what's, can it retain those highlights? And yep. what's that uh, image like? Well, now you got the new UHD, which is you know the new TVs that were coming out and the new formats for videotaping. And that's why you need the special XQD card. Yeah, because, we're dealing with much higher bit rates now. Yep. So. Um, I shot a video of an uh, opera singer in a church in Detroit, and I filmed it real contrasty, like movie style, mm -hmm. but this is without color grading. <laughs> no color grading, nothing, just standard photo style. This is a standard just straight, profile. Just show me what does this camera do straight on standard. Just beautiful, just yeah. beautiful. So I think the most interesting thing about this camera is that I don't think we're gonna have to wait long for it to be a really diverse lens offering. And that's because there's three brands that are working on it. And this is kind of one of the first times that we've seen this. So we see it a little bit with Micro Four Thirds, but this whole alliance between Sigma, Leica, Leica and Panasonic. Talk about how you think that's going to affect the lens lineup that's gonna be available for this camera. Well, I work a lot of trade shows. I talk to a lot of people, and the biggest thing that they want is a variety of lenses. Mm -hmm. And where a lot of companies' shortfalls are, so ah, but they don't have any lenses, ah. So then they start buying third party, and they're searching all over because we all know the lens that's made for your camera is always the best one because of image stabilization, of course. But Leica and the L mount have always had a great relationship with Panasonic. And so by us moving into that, that allows us to stay with the larger Leica lenses. And Sigma's already in that arena. And I've already had a great relationship with Sigma because I've already worked for them. And so I already know behind the scenes if this stuff is for real. Mm -hmm. and, and Sigma does a great job. And then Leica is Leica, right? right? And so between the Panasonic and the Leica and Sigma, I don't think that there's going to be any issues finding great lenses. Yeah, I think we'll see I think we'll see a full system offering a lot faster than some of these other companies just now making the jump to full frame mirrorless. Yeah. yeah, I think that's going to be really great for adapting the lenses quick just so that they cover like the full gamut of what professionals need. Absolutely. So we know that there's going to be a pretty diverse set of lenses that are coming in the future. You know, they've already said that there's going to be a bunch coming by 2020, but when can we see the availability of this camera specifically? So we believe the shipping date's gonna be right around when all the dealers should have this camera should be the end of March. Okay, that's actually surprisingly fast considering yeah. it was only announced in fall of 2018. <laughs> yeah, I, I had no idea. I know when I initially saw it and it's, okay, I'm, I'm seeing it in front of me, but it's still behind glass. But maybe we'll see this at the end of 2019, but <laughs> I did not expect to be you know quarter one, quarter two of 2019. Gotcha. So that's really good. So you've already been really happy using the GH5 and the G9 for some time now and been really happy with all that's available to you on the Micro Four Thirds setup. When do you think you personally or other people might want to use the S1 instead of the Micro Four Thirds lineup? There's not much lacking in the Micro Four Thirds. I believe I could do everything I ever wanted to do with the Micro Four Thirds. Okay. So there would, there would never be a point where I think I would have to shoot full frame unless I am doing a billboard <laughs> okay, or I am doing a landscape or I really, I mean, even the G9's got high res mode, there's going to be a time where maybe I have a family in here of 36 people <laughs> and I got to touch up heads on there and switch heads and, and they're going for a great big huge wall portrait bigger than the wall. Yeah. Basically, when you're maximizing, when you're really looking to maximize quality of the file. I'm kind of in a similar circumstance. For my weddings, I use a body that has 24 megapixels. Okay. 
And then for my editorial work for a university, that's when I don't know if it's going to be on a really big poster, <laughs> really big billboard. Right. That's when I need like that that full frame sensor Great. and the extra megapixels. So. But the full frame really is when you really want to be a real high end photographer and you really want that real high megapixel resolution for some kind of fashion or editorial work or whatever it might be, now it's available. Mm -hmm. And the camera is an easy transition and it really is a, a beautiful yeah, camera. I, I could see a lot of people kind of using both yeah. for different purposes. You know, if they need a more light and mobile setup, then they stick with the micro four thirds. But, you know, they got the big corporate shoot coming around. Now you're going to need to step up to your full frame camera. So what happened with micro four thirds is most of the professional photographers go, I want a travel camera. I want a lightweight camera. Mm -hmm. And then they shoot with it and they go, well, this thing is just as good. So the technology is there. I think it's just whatever you want to carry around and what you're used to. Yeah, it's always a balance between the quality that you want to produce and then the actual physical aspect yep. of lugging it around and, and how yep. versatile you can be with it. As far as me as a photographer, I just wanted to take the camera through a bunch of different scenarios. Yeah, I mean, my audience knows I'm really brand agnostic and I just go where wherever the technology best fits my needs, you Correct. know? So I keep a completely open idea to whatever I might be using next. You know, I'm not any specific brand or slappy that's gonna stick right. with one thing for life. Right. You know, I just, I just wanna know what technology is gonna serve me best right. and serve others best. You know, and when somebody comes to me and asks about a camera, I'm not just going to tell them exactly what I'm using. Right. I'm telling them, you know, what I think is going to best suit their needs. And I think all audiences want to know, can this thing keep up? Is it doing everything you want it to do? You're a real photographer shooting as much as you can throughout the day. Can this do everything? Mm -hmm. And it's a great camera. Great. Wait till you see the images. Unbelievable. So before we wrap up here, while I'm in Jim's studio here, which has, I don't know, there's some Norman equipment, <laughs> some uh, what, Photogenic, Speedatron, a lot of pocket wizards and everything. But if you are a Panasonic shooter, there is a really cool flash system out there, Godox lighting that is completely interfaced with Panasonic equipment. So they've got a trigger, they've got speed lights, they've got strobes, big strobes, small strobes, they've got everything. And you can check out my channel if you wanna see more information on that. But Personally, I think that's the best flash system out there that works really well with everything that Panasonic has for features. So if you want to check that out, check out some of my previous videos. Uh, beyond that, we've got the Flex TT5 here. And exactly what Jim's saying, I talk all about this new Godox lighting, but that doesn't mean that you need to go run out and buy it. And if you're pressed for money and you've already got stuff that is perfectly usable, you can adapt it using the Flex TT5 from Pocket Wizard, and you can get you know full control. You can get your hypersync so that you can actually go beyond the camera sync speed. That's correct. Uh, you can do all that using things like the Flex TT5 system. So of course, I always rep the Godox equipment because it's what I use. But I don't want you guys to think that that's the only option out there. So make the best with what you got if you need to. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this different style video. I really appreciate getting to come over here with Jim and hear his insights on the Panasonic S1 because it's someone whose opinion I really respect. So I definitely know in the future that I want to explore this lineup as it continues to develop. So I'm really interested to see what it comes out in the future. Great. I appreciate you letting me be on your show. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave it a like, comment if you got any questions. I'm sure Jim will dive into the comments here too. And we can try to answer if there's any additional questions you have about this camera. Make sure to subscribe if you wanna see more of my videos. And until next time, keep on shooting.